guess? No? Excellent. So uh, without any further ado then, I would like to introduce the talk Social Network Analysis, a scary primer. Our speakers are Andrew Wong and Phil Vachon. Please give them a warm welcome. All right. Everyone is good? Having a good conference so far? All right, that's the only personal question we're going to ask because we're going to have to blow through this. Um, so what are social networks? What are graphs? Uh, social networks are really a specialized form of graphs. Um, you have traditional ones, meetups, conferences, reunions, club memberships. These, we're all familiar with that idea, right? Like, if I mention Facebook, everyone's like, yeah, I have an account, but I've been meaning to delete it. So I mean, that, I mean, that deleted question really, I guess, we put the card in front of the horse there because that's why you should care. Uh, they're, they, they, give you, they give important contextual information about the participants and what their interests are or what they're doing. Oh, we, we, we failed. This is the year of Linux on the laptop, by the way, 2019. <laughs> Mark my words. So for those who aren't into graphs. Uh, this is what they look like. This is a form of graph. Um, you have nodes and edges. So you can think of, uh, you can think of the nodes as a thing, uh, a place, a characteristic, an attribute. Uh, the edge is how it associates with other nodes. Um, they, don't, they don't have to be uh, ordered or structured in any kind of way, well, other than making sure that your node-edge relationship makes sense. Uh, you have example, so, some examples of social networks. Uh, Usenet, obviously, because we like the old school stuff. But now you have Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. Uh, these graphs are pulled. The usual suspects. <laughs> these graphs are pulled from uh, Twitter hashtags, uh, mostly about the uh, Brexit and uh, French protests. But last year we did ones about uh, Schmookon and the interaction thereof. So. The important thing to know about this is that you're not always in control of your data, so a lot of social networks, you opt into them, you choose to participate. That is no longer really the, that's no longer true. Uh, with data breaches, you have email addresses and usernames, and you just get hoovered into these things which, without your actual knowledge or opt-in. So, uh, know that. So. The important part of this talk that you need to kind of understand is set theory. Uh, we're going to talk about rough sets. It's a way of uh, contracting sets by attributes and then being able to associate those attributes uh, with other sets. You have set intersection for obvious reasons like, hey, you know what, this person, this is the same entity in set A that shows up in set B. And then if you do the intersection, you know that both A, they're interested in, they have a relationship with set A and set B. Uh, so uh, these attributes could be email addresses, which you use for registering for a service, your date of birth, uh, any more, any, any attributes, more attributes, the easier it is to de-anonymize that information and figure out who a person is. Uh, and you use, we're going to use graphs to basically navigate the space to direct what you do with rough sets so you know where to go next logically to, to reduce your computational set. So here is just sample monitoring stuff. If you think about it, like everything you're putting out there in hashtag form, uh, you can take that, visualize it, and represent it. And of course, everyone's favorite Brexit, which has been a two-year nightmare. That's a raw deal. <laughs> so, We've got two dumpster fires on either side of the Atlantic here. <laughs> so uh, from here, you've got friend of a friend analysis, which is basically like, who does this person know? And who, do they relate, who are they interested in? You can build things, uh, the entity relationships. You can also then look at it and say, all right, you know what? We can figure out what kind of sentiment these people are interested in. You can scale this from an individual to a group of people to figure out what all their common interests are. And we then, you can do obviously interest segmentation so that you don't have to, you don't always have to associate an individual with the same set of people. Uh, 
So the real crux of what's going to happen next is the question of like the internet and meet space. Uh, how do we bridge these two? The internet is great because it's accessible. Lots of people can get together and share ideas. They can relate, form groups and communities. You usually opt in, but we know that's not true. Uh, because through techniques, you can find out like shadow profiles and so forth. Everyone is interested in the internet or these larger electronic meetups because you have a better diversity of ideas and uh, more likely to reach experts in the field if you can identify them and through their research dissemination of knowledge. Uh, in physical location has the problem that you have to actually go there. Uh, if the FAA isn't working or the TSA is being mean, you may not arrive where you're supposed to go. Um, and the quality of available knowledge varies because if you're at an academic institution that specializes in an area, you're going to get high quality information. If you're at a bar on the Lower East Side trying to talk to people about, you know, early colonial America, you're probably not going to get a high quality conversation. So with that, we're going to talk about BLE, which is something that you all have on you. So how many of you have a BLE device on you? <clears throat> oh, come on. Blizzard says you uh, all I have think, phones. I think, I, can say, I think all of you have a phone. I'm impressed if you don't have a smartphone these days. It's kind of getting a little novel. Uh, but we're actually going to talk about this now in the context of how do you build a social network in MeetSpace. And so we picked BLE as an initial topic to look at. And uh, we'll start with a quick primer on how BLE works. What a bonus that no one was expecting. So you can think of a BLE network as a combination of two types of devices. A central device that's a kind of master. This is the guy that everyone is connecting to. This could be a smartphone. It could be a centralized like hub for data, which is very common in smart home applications. Uh, but these are the devices that typically a user is going to interact with on some level. Peripherals, on the other hand, are the devices that you know, have a sensor or offer some value add capability to you. So some examples of peripherals, you can think of a Fitbit or um, a Tile or even an Apple Watch as an example of this. So uh, really with BLE, the goal though is to make this as convenient as possible for users. You have many devices, you have a whole gamut of different classes of devices even, uh, and they need to be really quick to be able to connect to your phone because otherwise people are gonna get bored of trying to use your app and they're gonna go off and do something else like probably play, I don't know, Candy Crush or something. So uh, in this particular diagram, we're showing just the logical view of a BLE network. You have several peripherals that are connected logically to a single central device. The BLE spectrum itself is divided into 40 channels. Uh, of those 40 channels, three are special advertising channels. This is what your device, your central, your phone, whatever you want to call it, is actually listening to for any devices to announce their presence. Now, when you look at the remaining 37 channels, that's all for when the de device is connected and they're starting to send data back and forth. Less exciting for the application we're talking about because we're trying to figure out what these devices are. Uh, when you receive an advertising payload, uh, you have this very standard structure. You have a two-byte header. This tells you the type of advertisement you've received. This could be a, uh, you know, an, an indirect advertisement, a direct advertisement telling your device it needs to connect or it can connect to something, or it could be advertising a capability like a beacon would. The uh, six-byte advertiser address is very interesting to us because that is structurally and functionally similar to a MAC address. For those of you who come from the Ethernet and Wi-Fi worlds, of course, you're very familiar with this. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one thing that's important as well with advertising data is that you have this concept of these tag length values that you also include in the advertising packet. These values actually contain flags that tell you a little bit about what the device's capabilities are. There's some information about what the services presented by the device are. And of course, uh, you have names, which, you know, that's how when you look at your, uh, your phone and you're looking at the BLE devices that are around you, you can say, oh, this is a Tile or an Apple Watch or something similar. Uh, these, service these, um, these service identifiers and the uh, complete names and uh, the uh, shorthand names are very useful when you want to try to identify what kind of device you have. Let's talk quickly about address types. 
So for those of you who are familiar with Ethernet, the top address type, the public device address, is really quite, uh, co quite familiar to you. Uh, this is basically where 24 bits of that is a random number that gets assigned by the manufacturer. And then you have 24 bits that are an OUI, an organizationally unique identifier that, are, that is usually administered by the IEEE. So if you have a public address, you can get a good idea of who manufactured that device or the chips that are in it. Um, the, uh, as you get into specialized BLE capabilities, there's talk about, for example, a random static address or a, a non-resolvable device address. And these are addresses that actually uh, indicate that the, what the device is, and once you've initially paired with it, you actually will be able to find the device again very quickly. And uh, they're, but they're not intended to rotate. They don't change. They're going to remain the same. So day in, day out, this will be the same value. A, in the case of a, uh, a resolvable device address, however, these ones are a little more interesting because they are intended to rotate periodically. And the resolvable device address, when you connect two devices for the first time is actually created by swapping keys between the two devices. And so when your central wants to find a particular device, it looks at the set of all devices it finds with a resolvable address and then calculates a hash of the PRAND part, the random number. Uh, that hash is then concatenated with the random number and that is the, the address that you're able to connect to then to basically say, hey, this is a device that I know about. And just a really quick primer on what data we can get from a BLE device, and this is all building up to something much more interesting, I promise. Um, the, uh, any BLE device exposes one or more services. Services are a group of attributes. Uh, attributes uh, are basically contained under char or contain characteristics, which can be something as simple as, in this example from microchip, a heart rate monitor. So if you look at this one, you'll see the first characteristic that, characteristics that's exposed is actually the heart rate itself. So uh, in my case, because I'm up here giving a talk, it's probably like something like 90 to 100 beats per minute. Uh, however, these are how the fundamental unit of how you communicate data uh, between a central device and a peripheral. All right. I'm sure some of you have seen these devices kicking around ShmooCon. We are the ones that put them out there. This has nothing to do with the wireless CTF. Uh, they're not foxes. For those of you who took them and dismantled them because you thought they were foxes, thank you. <laughs> we would like them back, but maybe not that much. You can keep them. It's fine. Um, however, these uh, sensors that we've developed actually will basically uh, scan all the advertising channels continually. Um, the, they will look at these uh, advertising channels, grab any advertised device addresses, extract any metadata from that advertisement. So that would be the names, the characteristics, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then it will decide, can I connect to this device or can I not connect to this device as a peripheral? And if it can, then it will actually connect to the device and interrogate everything that that device is able to, to uh, tell you. For example, it will get a list of all the characteristics, it will get a list of all the services, and then we'll archive all of that later on. Now. Uh, some of the identifying data we collect includes those character that characteristic data, uh, but also we collect this device address, as I was alluding to before, the advertising address. So just a quick uh, interlude. We did have one device go missing um, yesterday. Thank you, whoever took it. Uh, but that device that went missing, we think there was someone who thought they were being cool, kind of like this guy from Hackers. Does anyone remember the plague? Yeah. That movie was in the 90s, so I don't know how many people here would remember that. Uh, anyways, uh, really cool, but please, if you want to bring it back to registration, that would be great. This is a tracking device. You literally stole a tracking device. <laughs> right? We know where you are. Thank you. All right. So the thing is, is one sensor isn't really that useful. Uh, in fact, you probably need several sensors, like an ungodly number of sensors. Well, not quite. So for covering all of ShmooCon for our application, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, we actually put out about 20 of these. So you don't need a lot of them, but you need enough. And our hands are raw from basically assembling these things over the course of last weekend. So uh, all the things we do to basically get internet points. Um, so we did keep these as cheap as possible. Uh, the ESP32 microcontroller drives it. For those of you who aren't aware, this is like the cheapest 
Chinese microcontroller that does Wi-Fi and BLE that you can get on the market. There's an 18650 lithium ion cell in there, so we don't need power, uh, or that provides power more accurately. Uh, Wi-Fi, which we used to backhaul the messages to a server up in the, the cloud, so hopefully it doesn't rain. And uh, we do BLE scanning, of course, with the BLE core, and uh, we then wrap all this up in protobufs because it's trendy-ish, I guess, right now, and uh, deliver it to a backend server that then unwraps that and stores it in Elasticsearch, which, uh, well, Kibana is probably the best way to represent Elasticsearch for visual purposes. So in the process of doing our analysis, um, we decided that we were going to shame uh, some particular design flaws, and we actually found something very interesting. But first, let's talk about the types of data that we saw during this process. So how many of you have a smartphone again? Yeah, be honest. Come on, we're not going to shame you too. Oh, maybe a little bit. Um, so smartphones, if, especially Apple, Apple does a very good job of this. Resolvable addresses, they rotate on a regular basis. It's about 30 minutes. Uh, Apple Watch actually does something very similar. Uh, the rotating address, of course, means it makes it very hard for me to say if I have a sensor here at ShmooCon and then a week later I have one out in the mall, uh, I won't be able to directly correlate that, which is quite handy. Um, there actually, though, is some, interest, some interesting metadata that you get out of these, uh, the first being that there's a model number. So you actually see that's iPhone 11, comma, what is it, 6, uh, which is an iPhone XS Max, tells you a lot. Um, the phone was a little bit drunk, so we had to tape it up when we were uh, trying to take the mugshot. Um, so that metadata, though, is actually helping you reduce the set of values that could be matching a particular user. So I have an iPhone XS, I have an Apple Watch, but the particular models actually can be refined down even further based on that metadata. Uh, fitness tracker, I mean, we're just after New Year's here, so I'm sure some of you went out and bought a fitness tracker of some sort to, you know, as a part of your, your New Year's resolution to stay fit and healthy, right? Nobody, okay. Um, well, I would have Definitely the wrong audience. Wrong audience, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, these things uh, among normal people, not the computer community, um, actually are everywhere. Uh, interestingly enough, Fitbit being, of course, a dominant player in this space, but we're not naming anyone in particular in this particular slide, of course. Uh, however, these devices tend to have a static address. So what does that mean for most purposes? If I see your Fitbit here at ShmooCon and I'm doing a talk at TorCon about with the same sensor network deployed, I will be able to tell you're at both of them. So things start getting interesting. Next, uh, we'll talk about these uh, beacons. So uh, these beacons are very popular to help people find their keys. You're rushing out in the morning. Uh, you can't find your keys for some reason. Nothing's more annoying than we have that critical, uh, you know, red team report that you have to write for that morning because you procrastinated on it after the last incident and all that. Um, good for you. But Tile and other uh, beacons also use static addresses. In fact, to the point where um, there is continually beaconing that static address. So uh, this makes life tracking you, in fact, even easier if you have one of these devices or even multiple of these devices on your person at a time. So we decided to prove this concept out, and we created a very sophisticated web app called Where is Shmoo? So it's, it's at whereisshmoo.com. And we put a, a BLE tracking beacon on Shmoo and he, uh, so people could find him throughout the con. Now, if any of you asked, who is Shmoo and what does he look like? I don't have an answer for you. But you should find him and feed him beer because he is a furloughed federal worker. <laughs> so really what we're getting to out of all this is that uh, this is slightly dystopic. We have these really nice mechanisms that allow us to uh, easily track you if you have a static device on you. So it's basically a lost cause at that point. Uh, however, what we also found is that with these devices that have rotating addresses, if you have multiple such devices, they're actually out of phase with respect to when they update their re resolvable address. So if I have an Apple Watch and an iPhone, for example, they might be out of phase by several minutes when they rotate. So so long as I see you at a sensor across a whole network of sensors at least once in every 30-minute interval or, or, more, or, or sooner, uh, that actually will allow me to be able to, over a window of time, track you as you move, say, for example, throughout a conference. Something to think about. 
So uh, we thought about some use cases for this, mostly just to shock people, or I mean, maybe no one's surprised about this. We weren't, I guess we, we weren't that creative when we came up with them. I think, I think everyone kind of knew that you could be tracked in some form, but the important part, the takeaway is, on the website, uh, where is Shmoo, it's an actual implementation. This is, this is something that you yourself could run, uh, be it uh, at your home for security purposes if you wanted to know what addresses go by and so forth. Like this is an implied network of devices which you could roll up to say an identity of an individual. So we'll, we'll skip the examples, but you don't have to be that creative to come up with them. We're not very creative. But what we want to talk to people about really is what are the options here. So uh, Raven the chicken here is eager for someone to adopt her. And uh, one of the suggestions we have is that you can take all of your BLE connected devices and throw them in the Potomac River. And then, uh, well, do that in an environmentally responsible way, please. And uh, you no longer would have to be bound by this, and you can go move up to the mountains and raise chickens. So, however, there's probably something a little more practical that we as information security practitioners could uh, undertake, which is we could actually look to try to make this better. And we have lots of ideas on how to do that, but this is a 20 minute talk. So we don't really have an opportunity to talk anymore as they're telling us back there. So in summary, there's this. Uh, any questions? Um, why would you do this? That's a good question. We're not going to answer that one because we're too ashamed. Uh, if you do have questions, I guess since we're out of time, come find us. We're interested in talking about this. We do, we do want other people to participate in this because it's an important topic. And as a security community, we should be a little more proactive. It isn't just enough to say, oh, look, they, Equifax gave my data to everyone in the universe. That's great. It turns out you're giving all your data to everyone in the universe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.